Thank you, Stephen. It's indeed a privilege to speak at the Oxford Union, a place where freedom of speech and intellectual debate has thrived for centuries. <coughs> when we were students, we were given an example of how the Oxford Union debated the 1930s with the die for king and country, and how in the next war, many of them made the supreme sacrifice for the sake of democracy. Anyway, thank you. <coughs> Today, I have had the opportunity to speak to two hallowed British institutions, the London Stock Exchange and now the Oxford Union. Many Sri Lankans educated at Oxford have made an impact in Sri Lanka. Among them were two presidents of this very union, my colleagues, Lalit Atulat Mudali. We studied at the same school. We entered parliament at the same time in 1977. We sat in the same cabinets. And Lakshman Kadrigama, who, like me, studied for the LLB at the University of Colombo, and then came to Barriol. They were both presidents of the union in the Hillary term of 57-58 and 58-59, respectively. And both their lives were cut short in Sri Lanka by the violence perpetrated, perpetrated by the LTET. I thought I'd speak to you, giving you a perspective from our hemisphere, given its heightened importance. I give a lot of thought to what should be the topic. I was born a subject of George VI, king of the dominion of Ceylon. George VI was not only the king of the United Kingdom, its dependencies and other dominions, but he was also the emperor of India. Today, Ceylon is Sri Lanka. The crown in my country has been replaced by a republic. The Indian empire has dissolved. The colonies have become independent. The largest remaining dependency of the United Kingdom is the British Antarctic Territory. <coughs> Before 1500 AD, the great centers of world power outside the Western world. In the Far East, South Asia, the Middle East, and the pre-Columbian Central America. These were centers of innovation and creativity, of wealth, of social organization, and great economic prosperity. For instance, in the 15th century, China had an enormous fleet of ships, the greatest fleet in the world. Yet, because of the rising affluence of the merchant class, the political elite decided to destroy this fleet and address the more pressing concern of the invading Mongols. So within a brief period of about 50 to 75 years, a small and not too significant part of the world, Western Europe, reached out and laid the foundation for a global hegemony that endured for about four or five centuries. Between the voyages of Columbus in 1492 and Magellan in 1522, the Western world began to establish a set of footprints so extensive that at its peak, on the eve of World War I, about 100 years ago, the Western world controlled, occupied, or owned 85% of Asia and Africa, and an equivalent share of the global wealth. At its core was the Anglo-Saxon heartland of Britain and America. Yet, as the 20th century unfolded, this hegemony began to dissolve. Two massive cold wars, the protracted world wars, sporadic anti-colonial revolutions, as well as the Vietnam War, saw the atrophy of the Western world and the mighty global footprints of empires diminishing. The collapse of the Soviet Union and Communist Europe in the 1990s led to a brief unipolar global order dominated by the US but it did not last. Instead, the last five decades of the 20th century, many Asian countries, led by Japan, China, India, and South Korea, commenced industrialization. 
producing goods and services for the developed economies. They also mastered sophisticated infrastructure technologies, developing high-speed railways like that between Tokyo and Osaka, developing cutting-edge city ports like Shanghai, converting paddy fields into gigantic manufacturing zones like Shenzhen, old colonial canton cantonments into multinational software centers like Bangalore and Hyderabad, transforming old historic cities into global metropolises like Seoul. Technological leapfrogging brought these countries into the forefront of development. Large populations, which were previously seen as an economic burden, are now seen as the marketplace for products, services, and ideas. Around 4 billion of the world's population is already in Asia. This not only presents a marketplace for products and ideas, but also marketplaces for futuristic imagination, innovation, and invention. The Asian Development Bank states that Asia is in the middle of a historic transformation. If it continues to follow its recent trajectory, by 2050, its per capita income could rise sixfold in purchasing power parity terms to reach European levels today. It would make some 3 billion additional Asians affluent by current standards, by nearly doubling its share of the GDP to 50% by 2050, Asia would regain the dominant economic position it held some 300 years ago before the Industrial Revolution. Such historic and contemporary shifts and dynamics in global power means that we live in a transforming world. Old powers die, new players emerge, future balances are fashioned, and former life cycles are reinforced. In this reshaping, a new global cartography seems to be emerging, which will probably take a decade or two to crystallize. At best, I can visualize it. Four quadrants are beginning to take shape, each with a great potential for global influence and power, each with some major challenges, which will determine its impact on the balance of power in the new world order. One quadrant is, of course, the Western worlds, the members of the NATO and the European Union, the captain of the world's wealth. Future of the Western world in the global landscape will fundamentally depend on whether it can maintain cohesiveness or whether disunity will erode its position. The Western world will maintain the highest per capita GDP. It will be in the forefront of technological development and innovations. US would still remain the strongest global military power. The Western world, acting together, will have a significant military crowd, but the ability to maintain its power projection will require allies in other parts of the globe, especially Asia. The second quadrant is, of course, China, with a close one and a half billion people. The astonishing economic advancement of China in the past two decades has profoundly reshaped world affairs. Moreover, the assertiveness of the People's Republic under President Xi Jinping further reinforces this ascendancy. Beyond the Southeast China Sea, the Chinese are attempting to make an unprecedented outreach to the developing Asia, Africa, and Central Europe. No other major nation in our time has been able to orchestrate such a comprehensive and interconnected strategy. The third emerging cluster is the Islamic world, gain about 1.6 billion people. Islam has long been a staunch faith, which has had occasional political explorations beyond the Middle East. But for a century, since the fall of the Ottoman Empire, Islam has had very limited impact on world affairs. However, in the past three decades or so, the political temperature of Islam and its geographic outreach has grown exponentially. Nevertheless, the Islamic world is riven with conflict. Yet, uh, despite these differences, the Islamic world has gained a considerable measure of political significance recently. A group 
with access to vital natural resources with major followings in about 50 to 60 nations all over the world. The fourth quadrant consists of the remaining countries. While these will not be a unified group, there will be those who are both economically and military powerful in this amorphous collection of states. However, they will possess the potential of determining the final outcome of this power play. Other than Russia, Japan, India and South Korea are Asians. Though not possessing a combined military force, ASEAN will also increase its clout to become the fourth largest economic bloc by 2050. The global order put into place at the end of the last century considers the Western world, Asia-Pacific and the G8. The Indian Ocean, which was the main sea lane for east west shipping, was not in the equation. But today, the rapid Asian economic growth is driving tighter linkages with the Middle East and Africa. As a result, the Indian Ocean sea lanes today carry approximately half the world's containerized cargo, two-thirds of its oil shipment, and one-third of its bulk cargo. The Indian Ocean economies have an extremely rich resource base, accounting for nearly 70% of global, 17% of global oil reserves, 28% of proven natural gas assets, 35% of global iron production, and 28% of global fish capture. It is rapidly growing population currently makes up 35% of the world's total. This global power shift has brought the Indian Ocean to the forefront, resulting in three of the quadrants and the other Asian powers, making Indian Ocean the chessboard for a new power play. This competition has led to a number of trade and infrastructure initiatives sponsored by both China and Japan, as well as India, the main littoral state, starting its own initiatives. China's Belt and Road Initiative covering three continents, the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank and the Shanghai Cooperation Organization seeks to establish a China-centric transcontinental relationship in a multipolar world. Yet, the expanding presence of China in the Indian Ocean has raised concern amongst other countries, especially in the context of the expansion of the naval forces. Japan, the first entrant into the Indian Ocean of five decades ago, has expanded its program with the free and open Indo-Pacific strategy and the Partnership for Quality Infrastructure. Similarly, India has launched Act East and Neighborhood First policies. Japan and India have made a joint declaration to act together with the aim of upholding the freedom of navigation and promoting growth in Africa through the Africa-Asia Growth Corridor. Earlier, the Indian Ocean was considered to be of limited strategic importance. However, now, its significance is growing to the extent that a new concept of the Indo-Pacific is emerging. This is an indication that powers of the Western world are becoming limited. The best example is of Japan coming forward to lead the comprehensive and progressive Trans-Pacific Partnership when the US opted out. Furthermore, Japan has now invited the UK to opt into the same CPTP. Yet, the concept of the Indian uh, Pacific and its objectives had years to be defined. Some have welcomed the Indo-Pacific as a means of containing China. Others see imaginary Chinese naval bases in Sri Lanka, whereas Sri Lanka's Hambantota port is a commercial joint venture between our Ports Authority and China merchants, a company listed in the Hong Kong Stock Exchange. There are no foreign naval bases in Sri Lanka. <coughs> our Navy's Southern Command is being relocated in Hambantota to control port security. The US Defense Department has been briefed on these developments. Sri Lanka Army's 1-2 Division is stationed in the vicinity. We are also concluding a similar commercial agreement for the Hambantota Airport with the Airport Authority of India. <coughs> in this atmosphere of suspicion, many countries fear that the South China Sea issues can spill over, leading to 
further militarization and military competition in the Indian Ocean. This has resulted in a number of stakeholders intensifying their interest and presence in the Indian Ocean by expanding their fleets, upgrading their bases, securing access to foreign ports, and aggressive naval posturing via joint exercises, extended sorties, and live fire drills. Therefore, it's necessary to maintain the distinct identity of the Indian Ocean within a larger Indo-Pacific. The interests of the smaller states are best served by advocating for and upholding a rules-based order in the region. Thus, for the Indian Ocean region, it requires a common understanding that will ensure peace and stability within the region. This understanding must be based on the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea. There is also the need to work towards building a regional framework for both trade and security, while ensuring that the region remains free, open, and in inclusive. Consequently, the Indo-Pacific should be a functional concept in creating the architecture for a multipolar region, a first step to containing tensions in the Indo-Pacific, with its patchwork regional politics under different umbrellas such as APEC, Shanghai Organization, and ASEAN. A classic example is Russia, a member of the first two organizations simultaneously having close relations with both China and India. Furthermore, if we are to closely integrate the markets of Asia and Africa, we have also to uphold a multilateral trading system. The establishment of the regional comprehensive economic partnership is a prerequisite step which will also give ASEAN a key role in Indo-Pacific. As strength in UNCLOS is imperative for the security of smaller states in the Indian Ocean, Sri Lanka is bringing together 40 Indian Ocean littoral states and its major maritime users to a conference which seeks to serve as a platform for regional dialogue, initiating conversations on the outstanding issues relating to UNCLOS and laying the foundation for further confidence-building measures in the future. For Sri Lanka, organizing this conference is about reclaiming its long-standing tradition of normative leadership for greater good. From 1951, when we organized the Colombo Plan Conference, onto the Asian Powers Conference, non-aligned meetings, uh, Sri Lanka has called regional conferences from time to time as the experience we are built in together with our experience in the UN conference on the law of the sea. We are, uh, in a sense, returning home to an area of international law that Sri Lanka has played a key role in creating. It is Sri Lanka's contribution towards an international public good rules-based order which will in turn facilitate a stable and prosperous Indian Ocean region in the coming decades. Thank you. So I want to begin by following on from the issue you raised in your speech about the Indian Ocean and the trade relationship you have with China there. Given the uh, increased assertion of Chinese economic and military dominance in the Indian Ocean, um, how can countries like Sri Lanka, which are smaller, feel safe with the protection of international law, given that there has been a tendency to chip away at the rules-based international order at times? Is it international law that makes you feel safe, or are there other recourses that you seek? There is no military dominance in the Indian Ocean by the Chinese. It's difficult for any outside nation to get in because the choke points a different entry to the Indian Ocean. Economically, China certainly is making a bid to create a China-centric order. But as long as it's commercial and it's economic, we can manage it. There have been questions of debt involved in different countries, but that's for each country to decide what's the level of debt they want to have with China. We ourselves are going to the next stage 
of getting in investments for industrializing and financial activity. So, we feel that Chinese presence economically is a matter for individual countries to determine how you handle it. Uh, militarily, Chinese have had some warships and submarines there, but it cannot have that military presence in the Indian Ocean. Actually, it is very difficult to get into the Indian Ocean if you are not a um, littoral country and other than the USA, the others are unable really to make a presence in the Indian Ocean. We were speaking earlier this evening about the non-aligned movement. Um, do you think the increasing tension, which is positive of uh, countries like America, like China, looking to invest, uh, in some ways parallels the pressures of, of the Cold War that led to the non-aligned movement? Are we seeing a, se a, tense, a sense where countries like Sri Lanka have to be neutral in order to court both sides of the financial markets there? No, firstly, the non-aligned movement came when the major powers were European or Western, or USA and Western Europe on one side, uh, Soviet Union and Eastern European on the other side. Today, the economic uh, shift balance has changed. It's Asia that's coming up. So, in that sense, as far as the Asian countries are concerned, we've had our relations for a long period of time. We have good relations with China, India and uh, uh, Japan. So, we, we cannot compare it to that uh, situation because different countries in Asia have their own relationships with the big three of Asia. ASEAN as a block deals with them differently. Uh, what we, are, what we want to ensure as far as we in the Indian Ocean are concerned are some of the issues in the South China Sea does not spill into the Indian Ocean and we, we can maintain our balances. Following on from the questions about the geography of the Indian Ocean, I want to ask you about the extent to which the Sri Lankan government uh, deals with the issue of climate change, rising sea levels, uh, coastal erosion. Obviously, it is very difficult for one country alone to address that issue, but as a country which is going to face uh, a severe challenge to economic growth based on this. Um, how do you work with more developed, more industrialised economies that are leading to the pollution uh, in order to ensure a sustainable future for Sri Lanka? The conference which we are holding on, on Indian, the Indian Ocean, our future, will also touch on this subject as to how we could work together first on climate change. It has had an impact on Sri Lanka uh, in the last two, three years. Unexpected floods, uh, we have had ongoing drought for two years, what we call four cultivating seasons as far as paddy is concerned, which has had impact on the uh, economy itself, the GDP growth. The same in uh, South India and with our population, it is it's, it's certainly becoming a serious issue, uh, climate change and we have to actually focus very much further in regard to climate change. We have not done enough in my view, we have to do more. There is often debate about the extent to which uh, newly developing countries face an obligation to deal with the problems that have been created historically by uh, wealthier countries that have more developed. Um, is it difficult for Sri Lanka, even if Sri Lanka begins to do more, is it difficult for it to do more on its own without the support of major polluters like America and China? No, the major industrialised nations, even in Asia, you could see in Delhi, in Beijing, the same issue. So, it is a question of all of us getting together. And, and making those decisions. South India is different, South India and Sri Lanka so far, but uh, a major effort has to be made by the key Asian powers. Japan has shown the way of how you can deal with climate change. So, it is up for the rest of it. It is also means for countries like China and India, the transformation from traditional conventional industries and smokestacks into the new age. That, that's going to take time, that's our worry. Climate change impact may be on us much earlier, I read maybe 2040, 2050. So, that, that's, that's the continuing battle we have, Stephen. Moving on to the issue of domestic politics. Ever since you first began negotiations with the LTTE or Tamil Tigers in the early 2000s as Prime Minister, you've occupied a political position of moderation between nationalist politics on both sides of you. Um, Given that the military defeat to the LTTE is now complete, what's the best way to encourage further social and economic integration of this community, uh, both in Sri Lanka and in the diaspora? A military defeat of the LTT was inevitable since the LTT did not take the opportunity that was available to come for talks and it lost its credibility. 
Second, it has also decimated uh, the Tamil leadership. What was required after the defeat of the LTT was a serious attempt at reconciliation. This is why many of the political parties got together, we put aside our differences, put forward a common candidate and now we started discussions among ourselves as to what is needed for reconciliation. The return of lands which were occupied by the military at that time, when the war was on, resettlement of people, which means building houses and uh, getting them back into occupation, the question of war victims, the war widows, both in the north and the south, we have brought in new legislation, we strengthened our Human Rights Commission, we have established by law a missing person's office so they can start taking account of who is missing, where. Uh, it goes back about 30 years in any part of the country. We uh, have just, I think this week, Parliament will debate and enact the Office of Reparations. So when recommendations are made by the Office of the Missing Persons, we, the Cabinet has decided to repeal the Prevention of Terrorist Act and replace it with a uh, Prevention of Terrorism uh, law, which we have been discussing with the EU, with the British government. Cabinet has approved it, so it has to go through the procedure where people can challenge it in uh, courts and then come back to Parliament. Uh, my office is now drafting a Truth and Justice Commission. We are carrying out our investigations into deaths which have taken place both in the North and in the South, including two members of Parliament. We have appealed against the decision of the uh, High Court in regard to the uh, evidence available. Uh, the trial of the uh, killing of one MP. The whole judicial and legal process is working. It's slow. Invariably, collecting evidence is not the easiest. But uh, the whole system is going forward, and that itself has now drawn up uh, discussions, and we, now we are on to reconciliation. How do we, re we have a separate Ministry of Reconciliation? Former President Kumar Anatunga is uh, heading another group on uh, uh, reconciliation. And what is interesting in the North now is the pressure has turned from the political or the human rights issues into development issues. Why aren't we having our roads repaired like the rest of the country? Why aren't we having our water systems? Why aren't our schools getting upgraded? So it's in a way uh, good because they are coming into the normal uh, stream of politics, demanding employment, demanding housing, demanding development, and we have to cater to it. We've been talking with the Tamil members of parliament to represent them. And I would say the, uh, the government, for the government or for the political system, it's a welcome change that the people are now focusing on their main needs and they're saying, look, you have this in the south, you have it in the east, why can't we have it in the north? Uh, so it, you can see that gradually the political system is coming back into normalcy and at the local authority election, there were many independent groups that came up and took control of some of the local councils in the north. So given another five to ten years, the whole system will go ahead and I think now the major political parties are may also making inroads into the uh, Tamil uh, voter base in the north. One source of contention in the process of reconciliation has been uh, how far to permit international investigations or international bodies to conduct their own uh, hearings and investigations. Uh, what do you feel is the most helpful way for the international community to engage? Is it to lead with uh, UN investigations or to allow Sri Lankan organisations to be the primary point of contact? We feel that the present system is functioning well. The whole question of international investigations came in when people lost trust in the judicial system. The Human Rights uh, Commission was not functioning properly. A Chief Justice was removed overnight. So that, that's the result of the civil society coming up and uh, the new constitution amendments have strengthened the judicial uh, power. It has strengthened the Human Rights Commission. So the work is going ahead and we feel in such circumstances it's better for us to do the investigations and anyone is welcome as observers. We also report regularly to the uh, Geneva. We have, uh, I think, the resolution. We co-sponsored a resolution with many other countries on Sri Lanka and its investigations. It will come up in March. Uh, regular issues come up in regard to the investigations in the European Parliament. 
because we are recipients of the GSP plus. Mm. There are questions that come up in other parliaments. I think there's sufficient international coverage and our process is working. Sometimes it's slow, I admit that. It's slow in any country, but the process is working. And uh, it has also led to, uh, we brought in the oversight committees in parliament. So Tamil members of parliament are taking issues up. As we, at the moment, we don't feel there's a need for a foreign intervention in the investigations, but certainly uh, we will be reporting back and anyone is welcome to come and observe what's happening. We have not stopped anyone from coming in. So you first became Prime Minister 25 years ago, uh, in a time which has seen you know, significant conflict in Sri Lanka and now peace. Uh, do you feel that politics is easier? Is it less stressful uh, now that the conflict's over? Is it? <laughs> Is, your, is, you, yeah, is, is it more comfortable to be involved in politics now, or are the lingering uh, remains of that conflict still something that causes a great deal of, uh, of tension and stress to politicians who are trying to deal with this? I became Prime Minister in tragic circumstances. Within a week, Lalita Turanbudeli was killed, followed by President Prema Dasa. I must say now, we haven't the pressure of terrorist uh, attempts on our lives. But other than that, you have heard of the social media, that, that may be worse than terrorist attacks. <laughs> Life has become more difficult. It's round the clock, 24 hours, and you can't say security and take cover under anything anymore. So, life is more difficult. But threats on the life are no longer there. So we hope there'll be newer people coming into politics to take over. My party, we are now grooming uh, uh, the second line so that they should be ready to take over and reorganizing the party activities have been given to some of the younger ministers. We are trying them out, we believe in succession, so we are working it out. I'd like to open up to questions from the audience now. So if you'll wait till a microphone is brought to you, then we can have it. Okay. Let's go to the person on the end of the, the row right there. Yeah, with the uh, blue jumper. Great. Uh, thank you, Prime Minister. Um, I want to press you on the issue of the Hambantota port. Mm -hmm. So, in 1898, the Qing dynasty ceded Hong Kong to the British for 99 years, mm -hmm. and last year your government ceded Hambantota to China for 99 years. Now, despite there not being uh, a Chinese naval presence in the port, do you see the way out for countries like Sri Lanka in the Indian Ocean that have large debt exposure to China because of the Belt and Road program, ceding sovereignty or partial sovereignty over important ports going forward? Or is there another way for debt exposed countries to get out of this? Thank you. As far as the Hambantota port is concerned, it's a 70 year agreement, a joint venture between Sri Lanka, a Ports Authority, and China merchants, where China merchants hold a major share. But we are not the only country which has come into agreements with China on ports. Australia has done that. Half the world has come into agreements with China in regard to ports. We, we have control of security. We have control of the, the law and order. We control the customs. We control immigration. It is understood by the Chinese that this is an economic project. As I mentioned, our, our southern uh, headquarters are moving into uh, Hambantota. Already Japanese and others have, warships have come there. We are welcoming Americans or anyone to come in there. Similarly, just that China, I, I led the negotiations in regard to the Hambantota harbor. It's a question of Chinese got the first offer and if the first offer was not good, we are going to give it to others. Similarly, we have developed the Hambantota airport. We gave the first offer to the Chinese who had built it. We were not satisfied with the first offer. And now we've come to an agreement. We are negotiating with the Indians. And similar joint venture will be there in the Hambantota airport with the Indians. The government of Sri Lanka controls the roads between the airport and the harbor. So we, I, this, it's not a major issue as far as we are concerned, but we feel we have been developing a new ARC hub in a very undeveloped area of Sri Lanka, which will lead to industrialization and major uh, plans are underway to make it also a tourist resort. From the airport, it's about two hours to Arugam Bay where you're having surfing, another uh, hour down onto the other side. So it's, it's, uh, it's really not a Chinese controlled harbor. Chinese did come in once long ago, but uh, it was a short period. And as I mentioned, the Chinese themselves got alarmed and destroyed their fleet. 
So we would like to see Hamban Tota Airport and the port both develop as economic propositions. Uh, there are agreements, we can at any time uh, take it back, but we have to pay compensations. So as you, as you go along, we have the ability to draw in ships to that port, we have the ability to draw in uh, planes to that airport, and we hope the two joint ventures, the Chinese and the Indians, will uh, pave the way. As far as the debt is concerned, our debt, uh, because debt now is the international sovereign bonds, and what's affecting us is now the increase, the increase in the barrel of oil, and the exchange rate fraction that affects us. It affects India, it affects Pakistan, Indonesia, the whole lot. That, that's, that's, that, that's the big problem. Fantastic, let's move on to the next question. Mm. Let's come to the uh, gentleman in the blue shirt here. Great, thank you. It was interesting that you mentioned coming out of the Cold War and then this new rise of Asia and particularly China. And I was wondering, to what extent do you see that as linked into ideology in the same way that it was with the Cold War, with particular reference to the more government-controlled economies of the economic miracle Japan and modern-day China, and also their rising influence in Africa through investment? Fire, the ideological battles were concerned and the Cold War, by the late 70s and early 80s, the Americans and the Chinese and the Pakistanis are working together against the Soviets and ensuring that they fail in Afghanistan. That's a sort of a arrangement that went on till recently when Chinese uh, wanted a bigger say as far as uh, global power sharing is concerned. The economies of Asia, uh, we won't be free market in the sense of what you see in USA, even uh, in Japan. The Ministry of Industry and International Trade has uh, been a guiding influence, more so in South Korea, where President, former President Park virtually laid down the plans for the private sector. Uh, China has its own version of uh, socialism with Chinese characteristics, uh, which again, and Vietnam, which are basically market economies but controlled by a single party. India itself is open up gradually. So we, the economic model, market models we have here, except in North Korea, are quite different from uh, both America and Europe. In Europe, you, they tried state intervention and it failed. But you take Singapore, virtually every large uh, enterprise there is owned by the state in different ways. So you, you, you are seeing there are a different uh, um, type of uh, market enterprise and then the conflict really begins economically. Now if you look at the majority of the Chinese firms that went in first to Africa or to our part of the world were construction companies in which the state has a stake. It was then followed by the private companies. So that's, that's China has really backed up its members with the Exim Bank followed by the AIIB. They haven't got the full structure. They're having a development department uh, coming in now. But the total backing has been given by the Chinese government for those companies to come in. So that, that itself is creating friction. But answer to that, as the Japanese have said, they have been investing is to come up with a, another investment plan. So what we may see may be multi-layered uh, economic systems. As long as they don't go to war, it wouldn't matter. There'll be India, Indo-Japanese system and a uh, Chinese system. ASEAN will be another block. And we will all sort of try to keep uh, moving in between them to see how we benefit best. <laughs> Great. Next question, please. <laughs> yeah, let's go to the uh, hand right there. Thank you. Thank you, Prime Minister. Um, I recently interviewed two of Sri Lanka's leading film directors, uh, Vimukthi Jayasundara and Sanjeeva Pushpakamara, for an article I'm writing. Um, they both express frustration that your government has no national policy on cinema. Um, you revoked the tax benefits for filmmakers that the previous government implemented. There's no funding for art house film or for the creation of a film school despite demand. Um, since Japanese funding has stopped for the Colombo International Film Festival, Sanjiwa told me that you're now the last, the only country in South Asia bar Maldives not to have an international film festival. Why is so hostile to 
the film industry and to arts more generally and to the Directors Guild of Sri Lanka? Well, uh, we've had some uh, film festivals in Sri Lanka, but there's also a tussle between some of the local producers who want to protect their market and the rest who want to open out. So that's, that's ongoing battle there in Sri Lanka. Some of the locals, producers and participants want a more restricted market for themselves, while the others want to open it out. We've had some film festivals. The latest ones, of course, have been uh, local on uh, the late Lester James Pearis, <coughs> who passed away about a uh, few months ago. We've had uh, the festivals around him. But there is a case for more uh, film festivals taking place in Sri Lanka. I'm all for it. <coughs> but I don't think my sentiments are shared by some in the industry. <laughs> Moving on to the next question. <coughs> right. Let's go to the uh, hand at the back there, the, uh, the grey jumper. Hi, Prime Minister. Thank you so much for addressing the Oxford Union. Um, in terms of militarization, I know you talked about that a little bit in regard to the Indian Ocean, but uh, I have to ask about the over-militarization of the North and Northeast uh, in Sri Lanka, particularly within Tamil minority groups. Uh, in some regions, the ratio of civilian to soldier can be one to three, and the numbers seem to keep rising. So I'm wondering if you could just address this uh, and what reper repercussions are being taken so the minority groups can live dignified lives. Thank you. As I mentioned earlier, we, we are getting back into normalcy. And as far as the North and the East is concerned, they showed that they also have political clout at the last presidential election. And all parties are now wooing the North and looking at what has to be done. That there are, uh, within the East, the political systems are functioning. If at all there are too many political groups in the East that no one can really form a uh, stable uh, provincial administration in the Eastern Provincial Council. But uh, normalization is proceeding in the North, especially in the Vanni, where the largest number of deaths have taken place. We have a large number of women-headed households, and we have to find, uh, we are finding livelihoods for them. There are uh, combatants, ex-combatants, who have to also find employment. Many of them don't want to move out of the North. And the real issue we have now is how do we get more economic development into the North, when investments are going into other parts of the country. <coughs> Great. Taking one, more que one or two more questions. Great. The uh, hand here, yes. Um, right there. Uh, thank you, Prime Minister, for your excellent speech. In 2015, when Sri Lankan government co-sponsored with USA the consensus resolution at the UNHCR, it was hailed as an example of goodwill and cooperation. However, contrary to the promises made in Geneva, the northern and eastern province considered the Tamil homeland continued to be occupied by army, even a decade after the war. Further, the high security zones, as promised in 2015, are not dismantled. The lands of Tamil minorities have not been returned. Do you think short-term political necessities have stopped the uh, much-needed uh, war rec reconciliation process? As co-sponsors of the resolution, we report back to Geneva, and we are to do so next March. Far as the lands uh, of the Tamils are concerned, bulk of the lands have been returned. There are some areas in which there are issues, mainly about 600 acres in, uh, in and around the major cantonments of Palali and uh, Kankasanthure. But within it, development is taking place. Now the Indian government is developing the Kankasanthure port. We are opening up many of the areas. Actually, land has been given out. The issue has been now to find the funding for the housing. So we are now raising funds for another 40,000 houses. We still mean that another 40,000 to be done. Uh, at, at the moment, more land has been uh, handed over. The issue really is uh, funding for housing. But general political activity is taking place. If we haven't done that, by now, they would have found serious criticisms of Sri Lanka in Geneva. There are EU delegations that come in here. There are different, uh, the American delegations that come into Sri Lanka. There's ongoing uh, dialogue. 
in returning normalcy to Jaffna, which we are all interested in. And the army has also reduced its presence in Jaffna. No one has asked, not, uh, no one has asked the army to move out fully from Jaffna. At the moment, we are having a law and order problem of small gangs <coughs> that are operating in Jaffna and how to enforce law and order there without having cries that you are actually cracking down for political reasons. Now, we are being accused by some of the people in the north that we are deliberately not taking action while we are cracking down hard in the rest of the country. But we have to handle the politics of it for some of them are ex-combatants. But uh, as far as the armed forces are concerned, the numbers have reduced. And recently, we were attacked in parliament for having amalgamated the battalions whose strength, we are below strength. The army has not been a major issue as far as the uh, uh, Tamil people are concerned. There, the relations are good with the, with the army. Army itself is now getting into civilian role. And the army is more interested in doing peacekeeping activity in Mali. So they, they don't want to have any uh, black marks. And anyone who goes overseas for peacekeeping is vetted by the Human Rights Commission in Sri Lanka to ensure that there is no uh, allegation against you. We'll take one final question from the audience. Let's go to the hand here. Um, Mr. Mukhmar Singer, you talk about the process of reconciliation and that say that justice is slow, but far from justice and reconciliation, there have been instances of torture and sexual violence documented by human rights groups like ITJP and Freedom From Torture as recently as this year, so things which are ongoing. And this has been brought to your attention. I'm sure you can hear the protest outside. Do you see yourself as being responsible for that? And why haven't you taken any steps to end it? No, we, we are taking steps. As you said, we will establish the Missing Persons Commission. And by next year, Missing Persons Office, by next year, we'll have the Truth and Justice Commission, which can go into it. I mean, it's a long process. These are not things that you can do overnight. You have to be know a public opinion. There are people who are against it. There are people who feel that we are unnecessarily probing into it. So we built up the public opinion, moved ahead, carried the religious heads, got their support. And by early next year, you'll have the Truth and Justice Commission, which can go into many cases. But there's a question of, in some, there's a question of the evidence levels required for a criminal case, but you may while you may not have that level for a criminal case, you may have sufficient evidence for a finding of a commission of inquiry. That's what we looked at the, uh, the Truth Commission in South Africa and some of the other countries. So we, we are moving ahead. And uh, we will have, I, I think the system is working in Sri Lanka to a much better extent than many other, other countries. Wouldn't the first step to be to end these atrocities being perpetrated by your security forces? As far as individuals are concerned, we are investigating and where there is evidence, we are taking action. Great. Well, thank you very much and I hope you'll all join me in a round of applause to thank Prime Minister Wickram Singer for joining us today.